Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. ISB. How are you, Dr. Hani? Alhamdulillah. Very good, very good. Good to see you. I, what do you mean by ISB campus? Young people? Yes, yeah, so part of ISB is a group of like 17 to 25 year olds, and that's campus. Inshallah, I will explain more. 17, 25, so I am one of you. Yeah, definitely. Yes, don't worry. Very good, very good, very good. Very good. People to join, inshallah, and then we can get started. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm ready for you. That's fine. We're just going to get a few more people on, inshallah. We've already got Okay. Assalamu alaikum. But you can talk to me to keep me going. <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah. So, one second. Assalamu alaikum. I've got a lot of my family and friends joining on today. Good. Yes, Sister Iman. Yes. What is the menu for today? So, um, inshallah, we'll have a conversation, and I'll learn a lot, and the people listening, inshallah, will learn a lot, and then we'll have a Q and A at the end, inshallah, where the listeners can ask you any questions they like. I'd yes, no to... problem. You, no problem, I... anytime. Thank you so much again for being here today. No problem, anytime, inshallah. You and your colleague, ask whatever you want to ask. I'm ready for you, inshallah, because I knew ISB a long time ago. Jay. Before its creation, uh, Farouk Murad, Dr. Munir, Zahid Pervez, uh, uh, plenty, plenty, plenty of them. And uh, so... I got a good relationship with them, alhamdulillah. I learned a lot from all of them. And today I need to learn from you. From <laughs> you as a man. From you, inshallah. No, 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 no. It goes both ways. I learn <laughs> from you mm -hmm. as a young future leader. And so, you see the mistakes that we have done in our life to prevent you from doing the same mistakes again. Mm -hmm. So what I am going to be with you today as somebody who has done a lot of mistakes, actually, so you should not do it again. But for me, I learn and motiv become motivated and inspired by your action and the action of your colleague in, uh, in the campus. Inshallah. So Inshallah. I think on that note, Inshallah, thank you so much for that, Dr. Hani. We will get started. Thanks, we've got quite a few people now. So, um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, As-Salatu Wassalam ala Rasulih al-Kareem, Rabbi Shalatu Wassalam. So, Salaamu Alaikum everybody, welcome to this Instagram live stream where I'll have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Hani Al-Banna who's joined us today. Um, he is basically the founder of Islamic Relief and has done many other um, wonderful achievements. So, I really didn't appreciate the work that Dr. Hani has done until I began to prepare and um, organize this interview. And in light of that, inshallah, my aim for today will be to um, educate myself and all of you on his work. So inshallah, we can um, learn from it and apply what he has learned to our life. Um, so t the, the schedule for today will be that I will interview Dr. Hani, we'll have a wonderful conversation, inshallah. And then at the end, there'll be a chance for anybody to ask questions in the Q&A section or just in the chat. So I'm interviewing Dr. Hani today on behalf of ISB Campus. And I know there's quite a few people here today who aren't actually part of campus. So just as a quick introduction to who we are. So we're a group of British Muslim youth exploring faith in a contemporary, friendly and spiritual way, um, uniting British Muslims across the UK, inshallah. Um, Right now with COVID-19, we've not had our normal residentials, which is such a shame, but we've had lots of masterclasses going on online um, and e-circles every other Wednesday, which are open to everyone. So to anybody in the chat who is not already part of campus, um, you can go visit our website at www.isbcampus.org.uk or alternatively, you can email us at campus at isb.org.uk. And that will all be um, in the post description, inshallah, once this is posted. So um, now just an introduction to Dr. Hani really. So I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the work that you have done 
and he's really the foundation of many Islamic charities that exist today, including um, Islamic Relief. So um, officially, Dr. Hani Abdul Jawad Al Banna OBE is the co-founder of Islamic Relief, which is the largest Western-based international Muslim relief and development NGO, which was established in 1984 in Birmingham by Dr. Hani himself. So, um, inshallah, if you're ready, Dr. Hani, can we get into the first question? Yes, I'm waiting for you. That's fine. <laughs> so, bismillah. Um, so, you, obviously, you grew up in Egypt. So, I'd like a little bit of an insight into your background growing up. What was that like for you? Um, and how is your background influenced who you are today? It is, it is your family. Yeah, Actually, the most, the most important thing which affect the life and the future and the character of a child is his close family, the father, the mother, and the brothers, and the extended family. This is when I was born nearly 70 years ago, and this was very, very strong connection between the small unit as my family, El Banna family, and the extended unit of other uh, relatives as well. So this is extremely important that actually to, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was talking about Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahim is the womb of the woman. He said, whoever communicate and connect and keep it contact, contact with him, Rahimani, uh, Ar-Rahim and ar uh, the, the womb of the mother from mercy, whoever become merciful to us, Allah will be merciful with him. So the family, especially the mother, like yourself, if you become one day to become your, if you become one day my mother, so you'll be looking after me. Mm. Mm, that's very true. So now moving on to um, Islamic Relief. So give us a little bit of background, like how it began. So you were obviously at university doing your PhD. So how did you go from doing that to actually creating Islamic Relief? It was not planned. It was not strategized. It was not a big vision for somebody. It was a reaction for what had been happening in uh, East Africa, in Eritrea and Tigray in 1983, uh, where we did not find any Muslim organization in UK wow. responding to the catastrophe of the famine in Eritrea and Tigray, which actually were a part of Ethiopia at that time. Mm -hmm. So we thought, uh, myself and my colleague at that time, he was, Dr. Hassan was doing his PhD in, uh, in chemistry, and I was doing my doctor of medicine in, uh, in medicine. Same medical, it's the same school, the same university in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. We thought to do something. Uh, so we started uh, printing leaflets at home. Uh, my wife was typing on, on the typewriter, typewriting machine. His wife was making actually, uh, what do you call it? Uh, fundraising, uh, not, not fundraising and charity one, just promoting the, the issue of the people in the, in the Islamic circle. Uh, we used to go from a street to street to road to road to shop to shop to mosque to mosque. There was nothing really, nothing, nothing, nothing. At that time, no desk, no office, no budget, nothing. But we started to leg it, actually. The, then we uh, managed to be to reach what we are seeing nowadays, but this is after nearly 37 years. Wow. Wow. And you, as I said, you, as you just said, you were doing your PhD. What made you leave everything, like your career prospects, um, and sacrifice all of that to um, go into humanitarian work? Like, what gave you the courage to do that? Well, I was at a crossroad between my study and between my uh, humanitarian work. And uh, in 1991, uh, I submitted my thesis, which I failed. No, no, 1990, mm -hmm. uh, my, my MD thesis, and I failed, alhamdulillah. Uh, then I had a major failure. Then after that, I submitted again in 1991 and I passed it. In 1994-95, I decided to have a very drastic decision. Enough is enough for medicine. Because at that time, the organization was growing and it should not be depending on volunteers. In the first five, six years, you can be a volunteer while you are doing some other job. But actually, when your income becomes a few million pounds, 
and it needs somebody to travel, somebody to communicate, somebody to connect, somebody to manage people. You need to start employ people. And here I'm telling uh, my young people uh, at the age, your age, and uh, younger or older, actually, you start your initiative as an initiative with a handful of people like yourself, Sister Iman. From there, you focus on this small project on a very low scale. Once it becomes fruitful and the community start to rally around you, you start to organize it. And you move from a step to a step to a step to a step till you organize your initiative, your idea, your project in a structured way which make it organization. Such an organization which would need policy, procedure, structure, budget, employees. And you can employ whoever you want according to the budget you have and according to the income you have. There's nothing for free forever. You start as a volunteer, you move from a volunteer to employ people. Mm. Wow. And what advice would you give to people like me in my generation and the people listening today on overcoming that fear of, you know, sacrificing things? Should we be career focused and focus on our degrees or should we try something new or go into humanitarian work just like yourself? Well, it's a decision. Mm -hmm. It's a decision. Okay, this is number one. I think if you have the vision to do something, do it. Mm -hmm. It's risky. Because at that time, if you look back nearly 35, 37 years ago, uh, going from an income to an income, or from an income to no income, from certain working hours, when you used to work in the, in the National Health Service, to unlimited hours. Because if there's a disaster in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or in Iran, as it happened, or in Sudan, or in East Africa, West Africa, Latin America, on whatever you call it, the country, like in Haiti and in Goma in Congo and others, this eight hours a day is not going to be eight hours. That's why you and your family have to, to pay the price of the work. And your wife or your husband will have to understand that during this uh, calamity, during this crisis, there's no time limit. Maybe in a good day when there's no disaster, yes, you can work from 9 to 5, there's no problem. Or sometimes you leave the office before 5 o'clock if you finish your job. But during the, 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 the problem, there's nothing called 9 to 5. And it's one of the risks. The second risk is uh, the, the salary. It's not going to be like when you work for, uh, for, uh, for another uh, company and the others to be, to be less. The third thing is the headache. Because in an organization, you can be working with different uh, mentality, different background, different communication, different, 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 different. Not like when you work in a company, you work with one or two products. But in, in, in that humanitarian work, you work with too many products and too many headaches and too many challenges. Number four, it is actually nowadays we are facing Islamophobia. If, if you are wearing hijab or niqab or burda or whatever, burqa or whatever you call it, actually, well, you are suspected till you prove something else. It's number four, number five. Number six is the money transfer, which is the problem facing the banking. If money is transferred from A to B to C to D, especially if you send money to Yemen, sometimes you send money to Syria, it is no way. It doesn't go. Okay. All these challenges will give you a big headache and will let you to be frustrated of trying to achieve your goals and objectives. Well, actually, you have to have the gut and the courage to say, enough is enough, I'm going to switch and go to another career. And Not many people you, have managed to do that. And, and what gave you that courage specifically? Uh, see, let me to, to tell me, by the time you, you put your feet, you dip your feet, your feet inside the ocean of your material work, you can't come out. Because you'll be infected and infested by the bugs of love. The bugs of love. So it, they will overtake you. 
So those uh, hematia, the, the, the love for hematia work is, becomes extremely poisonous, extremely infectious. It's like a plague. It goes to you and it controls you. Once it goes to your blood, it will never come back. It will never come out. Sorry. It's like, actually, like a magic coming to you, mm. controlling you, uh, what they call it, uh, holding you together. Mm-hmm. And you, if you go, I want to get out. No, no, no. You, you get used to a culture and to a philosophy of thinking, which is very difficult to find it somewhere else. Yeah, and so after you'd um, done your work with the famine in Africa, what was the next thing that you know? It goes. It goes. Like? It goes step by step by responding to different uh, uh, calamities or, or different disasters like the flooding in Sudan uh, after wars in 1989, like the earthquake in Iran 1990, like the big flood in Bangladesh 1991, like uh, the war, the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992-1995, like the conflict in Chechnya in 1994, 95, 96, 97, and like Kosovo ethnic cleansing in 1999, and it's non-stop. And once you have a role to play in the market of humanitarian work, you have a seat to drive your community towards playing this role. So you should not leave your seat. You should be always sitting there and presenting yourself, your community, your values, your culture, your belief, and your morality as well. Wow. So, you know, subhanAllah, including Islamic groups, there are so many different um, Muslim charities in Britain and, you know, across the world. And um, you often see that they're helping with the same issues. So be it what's going with the Rohingya, um, Rohingya crisis in Yemen, Lebanon. Um, I just wanted to know with your insight, what degree of collaboration exists between those different charities? When they're working Collaboration with as a question, you mentioned about too many charities. When we started in 1984, there was no, not, there was no, there was no Muslim charities in UK. Okay. Yeah. Now there are hundreds. Mm. Okay. It's a big challenge to try to coordinate. That's why we moved, I moved from Islamic Relief to Humanitarian Forum and yeah. to Muslim Charities Forum. Muslim Child's Forum is a local organization in UK, which I want you to support it, and you and the people in your campus, to try to coordinate the work between the international organization in UK. During the COVID period, mm-hmm. Muslim Child's Forum managed to do a lot of good work with about up to 200 local Muslim organizations in UK. Wow. The most difficult thing, Sister Iman, is how people will believe in communication with others, in networking, collaboration, uh, bridge building, and partnership. Some people, and I'm sorry to say this, sorry to say this, but you swallow it from me. Mm -hmm. Some people amongst our community worship the logo. Right. Worship the logo. And if my logo is not the biggest logo, on the advertisement, I'm not going to pay money for you. Why should you put my logo at the bottom? What is the logo to do with it? Are you here for the issue or for the logo? Mm. Okay, that's why we still, and this is a message to you and the people from the campus watching you. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever, and never worship the logo. Never worship the name and the title of the organization. Never think that your organization is the organization. Your organization is one of thousands of hundreds of thousands or of millions of organizations. Many, many, many small organizations could be far more better than our organization. And this is the ego, the ego which is inside the heart of the people who are managing some of the humanitarian organizations. They have very strong ego, and they could not be able to control their ego when it comes to collaboration, networking, communication, and building partnership. Because as I'm telling you, Sister Iman, and uh, you, yeah, the people with you on the campus, as I'm telling you, 
No one organization will be able to do it by itself. Right. It has to be all of us, collective. All the collective, all the collective, all the collective. I give you an example. If you want to do a research, which could cost us 50,000 pounds or $50,000, why would you do it alone? Why don't we sit down with four or five organizations and say, okay, fine, let us, the five of us, pay 5,000, 10,000 each, and it goes out of the name of other five organizations. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with this? If we want to make a statement or a press release, why, why should be, why, why I should be letting people to understand or to know that I am the first. If somebody tell me you are the first, I'll tell them get lost. I tell them most importantly to do what? Is to wait for others to be with you. And then instead of this statement or press release being made by one or two, let it be made by five or 10 or 50 or 40 to be more stronger and to be having the impact on the government the impact on the local community and the impact on the international community. But if you, if you, if you would like to issue a press release today, to be the first, okay, fine, you'll be the first. So what after that? But what you need to do is to learn to wait and communicate and bring people around your statement. So many people will sign this for you. And this is a problem, which is the ego and the logo. And tell your elder, please remove the ego from your logo and the logo from your ego. You know the logo? You do, and if you put the ego and the logo, you do what they call, what is the, the, uh, the you do the Lego. Right. You know the Lego? <laughs> yeah. So, and building off that, so if I, for example, had a hundred pounds, is it best for me to donate it to one charity? Yeah. Or is it better to spread it out? Because of obviously it, the issues of collaboration and things like that. No, it depends how much your money will have an impact. Okay. Because the less money you give to organization, the no impact you'll have. Mm -hmm. So if you think that actually I want to sponsor an orphan, mm -hmm. you can do it this way. Either sponsor one orphan, which costs X amount of money, or you go to the orphan fund, which is general, giving five pounds for each organization. Right. But actually, it's, it's, it's not just one size fits all. If you have got sizable amount of money, like if you talk about the thousands of pounds and you want to have an impact, you have to negotiate. Sorry, Dr. Hani, an so integral you... organization, so you can work with them. There we go. Okay, it's sorted out now. Yeah. So I just couldn't hear you for a second. There we go. Yes. But you're um, saying that it would be better, it, more money in one place has more impact, but it's okay yeah. to spread it out there. Okay, so Pamela, so moving on a little bit now, in your charity work, you've traveled to over 60 countries, many more. Is there any particular journey out of the many that you must have made that is particularly significant to you that you'd like to share with us today? I, I visited more than 82 countries. There you go. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Much more uh, the, 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 the latest visit was two weeks ago in Sudan, which I got a very sentimental uh, feeling towards Sudan, Sudan and Bangladesh, because they are the first two offices that we open. Uh, but if you talk about uh, the, the country which or, or, or the problem which affected me very much is Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Bosnia because it was ugly, filthy, ethnic cleansing, which the people who did it has nothing to do with religion. But I talk about, I don't want to talk about to mention the name of the religion, has nothing to do with morality. When they rape, more than 40, 50,000 young girls and even old women, when they killed uh, uh, about nearly a quarter of a million people, actually 80% actually, or 75 to 80% of them are from the Bosnian Muslims. Uh, when they destroyed about six or 700 uh, uh, mosques in the area, when they wanted to wipe out the culture and the history of a very beautiful part of Bosnia, which is the Islamic culture. This was very, it was actually home not home, sweet home, 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 home problem. And actually it shocked Europe. It shocked not only Europe, it shocked the whole world. And this before you were born as young uh, 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 girl or young man about amongst your, your, your campus, uh, this kind of problem, which is still, still has not been settled yet. There's actually a sort of unjust peace still controlling 
and actually managing the state as the state of Bosnia at the, at the moment. This is a, this is the biggest problem which are facing us. Other problems are actually could be looking at the flooding in Pakistan, the earthquake in Pakistan, and actually the war in uh, the war in in, uh, in Chechnya, the war in in, in Syria and Yemen. All of them, but actually the the biggest shock on 1992-95 was Bosnia, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. So, and again, talking about more current issues and things, moving back to the different charities that exist, um, compared to when you started Islam, Islamic Relief and you were working with Islamic Relief, how much has the Muslim charity scene changed, in your opinion? They progressed a lot. Right. I tell you something, in the 80s or 90s, I say about in the 90s, we were talking, uh, especially at the time of the Iran earthquake, people were talking, oh my God, they're Shia and Sunni. We were out on the road before even the Shia. And we raised about a quarter million pounds at that time in 1991, and we partnered with uh, uh, Iran earthquake, and we sent all the aid to Iran earthquake at that time. This was 1991. When Haiti earthquake came to hit Haiti, which is 99% of it are non-Muslims, or 99% of them are not uh, Christian even, they are believing some other uh, uh, religion or way of life, at least 15 Muslim churches were there to help on the ground or through other local organizations. See, between 95 and I think 2008 or 2009, when Haiti earthquake came to hit Haiti. See, so this kind of mind shift, mind shift, even we managed to convince some, some, some big uh, Islamic organization like Islamic Development Bank in, in Jeddah to donate for, for as a five or six million dollars to build schools for the victims of the earthquake in Haiti. So this shift took about, uh, took about how many? So about 15, 16 years. If you want to change the philosophy of thinking of people, it's not going to happen with a speech, with a statement, with a march, with a demonstration. It, it's, it's a building blocks to change the mindset of the decision makers. When you be able to uh, build new, what you call it, the critical mass, new critical mass, now we might have critical individuals. You could be considered a critical individual, as an individual, because you want to make the change. Yeah. But when the individual become a mass through an organization, structural organization, the, 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 the impact of the critical masses will be more powerful than the impact of the critical individuals. Mm. Well, and, and let me get my, let me before you ask me a question, I, I want I want to throw something. The challenge now I'm putting to the people with you on the campus and to anybody else. We need to write the history of Muslims in UK. Because the history of Muslims written by others in the good old days, all of it is fake or wrong or distorted. Mm. And while we are talking about ISB, or while we are talking about young Muslim ISB or the campus or the ISB campus, we need you to start telling your elder, hey, we need you to sit down and write the history. Go to Farouk, go to Dr. Murad, go to others, tell you sit down today. I write the history of this organization before you live the life, before you die, before we die. And this is our failure. We need you as young people to tell, to tell those leaders of what you call it, Jama'a group or call it Islamic organization, Salafi, Sufi, Shia and others. Write the history of the, your community in the country. Mm. Don't let others to be writing it on your behalf because they will never they will never write the true fact as you write it. And once you write it as different groups, like from the Shia background, from the Sunni background, from <coughs> the Salafi, from the Ahl Hadith, and, and Jamaat Islami, and, and, and Sufi, and others, we can sit down together. This is the history of Islam in UK. Don't, and this is a challenge. You tell your people, please, Iman, tell your people, if you don't know your parent, if I don't know my parent, I'm an illegitimate son. To whom? I don't belong to anybody. I will, I will be in the would be wilderness of not knowing my family, not knowing my history. And somebody may come and say to me, your father is so-and-so, your mother is so-and-so. No way. 
Let me get you another example. I was in, in Davos. Davos is what you call it, World, World Economic Forum. I don't want to mention the year. I don't want to mention the name of the, 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 the president of the country. He said a statement which is very dubious and dangerous and stupid. He said, why do you people want to know about your history? History is divisive. Don't talk about it. Let us look at our, our current situation and our future. I'm telling you, if you don't know your history, you will never understand how your forefathers or grandfathers or others managed to succeed, or you know you will not be able to understand how they failed. If you don't understand your history, you will never be able to manage your current affairs. So, Needless to say, to look about your future. And this is my challenge to you and every one of your colleagues. Start for your organization, start for the Muslim community here in the UK and tell them, don't let anyone try the history about you. Let us, all of us, try the history collectively and parallel. Wow. And this is my challenge and my message for today. Mm, that is, yeah, I can't, that's honestly... You have to do it. Yeah. Very, no, very you know, I'm, I'm, can you see my finger? I can see your finger. <laughs> it's coming closer to you. You have to do it. Mm, mm. You have the time and you push. Keep pushing. Mm. Till they start writing it in a very fair and transparent way. Mm. So everybody hear that? You need to start writing <laughs> history, inshallah. So I'm going to move on to a little bit more of a negative tone, unfortunately. So no we, were problem. Talking, we were talking a little bit about um, Muslim charities in the UK and how much they've progressed. Um, but realistically, um, in recent news especially, there have been issues of corruption within charities. Corruption. And so corruption. And stuff, despite all the amazing work they're doing, mashallah, and I'm not discrediting that. So what is your reaction to these issues that arise? I'm not going to mention any names or incidents. Corruption again, affecting Muslim charities. Is that what you say? Yes. And what, what do you mean? No, 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 no. Don't throw something like this and going away. What do you mean by corruption? So I think, especially in recent news, there were a lot of issues of volunteers um, behaving um, inappropriately, and the money not going to the correct places to actually help um, the people in need. Um, so I just wanted to know what your, obviously what your reaction is to this and what techniques do you think can be put in place within these organizations okay. to prevent this okay. corruption? No, no, you see, there's, there's a big difference between corruption okay. and mismanagement. Okay, okay. What you're talking about is mismanagement. Right. Okay. Uh, let me take you back, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. We should do something which you call future leaders. Like your age and the people younger from your age. Where we start to prepare our volunteers before they come to the organization. You know who should be sitting with them, Sister Iman? It is the president, the founder, and the CEO. Because those volunteers are the most important ambassadors for any organizations. When I came to UK in 1977, 1978, I was doing whatever they call it, a, a, a clinical attachment in one of the hospitals in uh, Aberystwyth. Right. You know Aberystwyth in Wales? Okay. And they used to send the young medical student to the hospital to be trained. I remember that the consultant was telling the staff nurse, the sisters, the junior doctors, and the registrar, look after this young student. Teach him everything you have. Mm -hmm. Invest in the volunteer. Don't leave the volunteer to a piece of paper which he can read. He wants or she wants you as a chairman you are the president, you are the CEO, you are the senior and the senior and senior to sit down with them and respect them and give them your history or you give them the vision and give them your experience. Otherwise, they will just young people. They might actually behave oddly. Invest in your human resources. This is number one. Number two, we should agree as organization that we should invest in building whatever we call 
young future leaders to enable them one day to be the managers and the directors and the future leaders not only of the church organization but of all the organization when you keep looking at a certain leadership in an organization which is there for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years tell them you are failure it's not your the length of your beard or the color of your beard or the henna on your beard or the mascara on your uh, eyes and other this is or your speech is this is waste of time mm-hmm. you have to have successive plan on leadership quality management you have a term in office for 5 years could be extended for another 5 years or 3 years or 3 years move on what are the women in your organization what are actually the young, the young men in your organization they are not there so they are you are a failure you are not a proper transparent organization you do not represent my community when you found that an organization is only having one color i mean as a one color as a school of thought only or one color as a ethnic background or one color as a national background coming from pakistan in the tell them you are failure you are failure you got it i'm saying this loudly go and find those elderly who love the logo and love the ego mm-hmm. out time is up i used to know an organization which was one one of the best muslim organization in the country in the 70s and the chairman refused to let go till he died it became one of the smallest organization neglected before he died because he, he, he strangled it and this is where corruption could come where corruption real corruption Corruption is not only in the money, it is in the way that you manage the organization. If you manage it on a clan system, or an ideological system, or because the organization, you, you know what? Your organization, the ISB sister, a man, does not belong to the people by speed, it belongs to the community. Mm. The community should have a say in your organization. Thank you me. have no right to ignore what the community wants and needs. It's not because you become a president or a chairman or secretary general, you have the ultimate power to do whatever you want. No, no, no. It is the creation of the local community. The local community, particularly the citizens of their country, have the upper hand on your organization mm. to stop the corruption. Yeah. So, um... Finally, moving towards, because I'm conscious of time now, so moving towards um, the end, I think now looking at what we can do. So what can we as the general British public do to help the miskeen in our country? Not necessarily just internationally, within our country. You know, what is the most effective thing that we can do directly? Should we be giving money to homeless people? Is that effective or is there something else that we can be doing in your insight into the charity sector? Yeah. First of all, in the, in the eight categories of zakat, you have uh, one of them is fi sabi'illah, you can give to anybody. Yeah. Second of them, al mu'allafat qulubum, you can give to the non-Muslims as well, even if they don't become Muslims. Home, sweet home. You can divide your zakat into two parts. A part of it go international, and the part of it because some of these countries don't have a social infrastructure mm-hmm. or social welfare in- infrastructure and some can stay here you give to the uh, let me let me tell you what to give it to you give to the dogs for the blind right dogs 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 how oh, oh, oh. dogs for the blind <laughs> to the, you know the walking stick for the blind what do you call it um, the walking stick for the blind yeah yeah okay you give it to the elderly Mm-hmm. you give it to the homeless you give it to the young people who run away from their family and they're living in these care houses mm-hmm. okay you give it to the deaf the blind and the disabled you give it to the non-muslim charities you give it to something like heart foundation and others give it to any organization of you whether it's Muslim or not Muslim, because you are a part of the infrastructure of the social weaving of the British community. 
You need to show how much love you have for every segment of the community. Otherwise, they will treat you as an alien. Mm. Neighbor, your neighbor. Yeah. I wrote a document called Grassroots in the, I think in the mid 90s or later. Right. Talking about cleaning the roads, collecting the rubbish, cleaning the window for the neighborhood, mm. okay, visiting the sick in hospital, giving a flower for those elder people. When you go there and you find some elderly non-Muslim old man and woman, nobody mm. visiting them. Mm. And next to an Asian Muslim brothers, plenty. Go and visit and give him a piece of cake. Mm. Seriously. Mm. Do you think Dawa is by speech of Maulana? <laughs> you know what? I ha ha till tomorrow. <laughs> I keep high. It's not a speech. Mm. It's not a speech. It's not a long uh, Genji beard. It's when you go and find your next door neighbor is not out in the garden. She might be dead. Or she might be dead because nobody's visiting them. Your duty is to go there. So divide your zakat and sadaqah between how much you can spend local on the local community, whether it's Muslims or non-Muslims, and how much you can spend abroad. But whoever tells you, listen to this, whoever tells you zakat is only spent in UK, tell him get lost. Mm. And what whoever, whoever said that, tell him somebody called Hanil Banna. Tell him get lost. I'm just saying it. Mm. I'm just saying it. I'm just saying it. And I'm very adamant and clear about what I'm saying. Zakat should be given to the, the, to the needy who needs it, people who need it most. Divided between local and the international. Because everybody needs your, your help. Mm. That's, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and how can we, um, I guess, raise awareness of the issue you just brought up, that we need to be helping our community more, we need to be helping um, communities abroad more. How can we raise awareness, not in just the Muslim community, but in our general community? Okay, you as young people who are very good at social media, mm -hmm. okay? Use your social media to highlight an issue, to advocate for an issue. I tell you something, how about you go? How many people know about that more than one million uh, Uyghuri people are in, in a big concentration camp in China. Mm, not in the people country. of Rohingya, the people of Democratic Republic of Congo, the wealthiest, the wealthiest country on earth, the richest in human and earth, is corrupted by companies who are stealing the resources and making conflict because 75 or 80 conflict armed groups. Not enough people. And no. their wealth is being stolen. You have to highlight for those people. You have to highlight for the rights of the Yemeni who cannot live properly and their country being stolen as well. The country like Syria as well. The country like uh, in, in what you call it in Central African Republic. Okay, Niger, Nigeria, you have to fight against the extremism, radicalism, and terrorism. And you have to ask a big question, who is supplying those groups with money and with arms? And stop them doing this. Because this arms supplying is claiming the life of many innocent people. As we condemn what happened in Austria, and what happened in France, we condemn what's happening in other countries as well. Because mm. there's no difference when it comes to act of terror or radicalism between Muslims and non-Muslims, between white and black, between brown and yellow. All are the same in front of Allah, in the eyes of Allah, in the eyes of the community, and the eyes of humanity. So this is your role, because you and your colleague have the power of using the power of the social media. Don't be used by social media, but use the social media. Wow. So, inshallah, that was, that was my last question for you. And I think, yeah, that is really, really important. We need to 
raise awareness and inshallah use the platforms that we've been um, blessed with alhamdulillah so now i think inshallah we'll move on to just a short q a section so for the people who are still here i think some people have stayed for the whole thing alhamdulillah if you have any questions i think some people actually posted questions earlier on so could those people please post it again in the chat so i can read it out for him or alternatively at the bottom of your screen there should be a q a button so if you have any questions for dr hani um, please do send them right now and I will um, ask them on your behalf, inshallah. I am ready for any question. Okay, so this Go is my cousin, Khadija. So um, what has been the most rewarding moment in your career so far? The most rewarding moment of my career, a donation which I took from a young uh, man in Brooklyn Mosque, which was a token, food token of $3. Mm. put token for his family for three dollars this was all what he had at that time in the 95 when i was there and the most rewarding moment is when somebody smile at your face a young orphan or a young elder or, or a young orphan a girl or a boy or a widow an elderly who can say thank you my son Thank you, my daughter. This is this is more than any more than any billion of dollar given to you, because this is the witness before Allah at how how you are being loved and respected by those people. Mm. Wow. So we got one more another question that's just come through. So somebody's asking for the names of three good charities to donate to. All the charities in UK are good charities. I don't make preferences to any charity. What they need to do is to search on each charity, the credibility, integrity, the structure, and the history, and the objectives, and the transparency, and give the donation. But I cannot nominate a charity by itself. Hmm. All of them are good for me, because all of them, my daughters are my sons. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So um, another question. Um, what surprised you about human character in this journey, good or bad? All the needy people have got far more, better, far more better character than ourselves. They always smile while they are in agony. They always draw or script a smile on your heart when they gla go, 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 go with a glaring smile from their eyes and hearts to you. And this is actually what makes people going and going and going during their actually work in this kind of field. Those people, to be very honest, are the master of our organization. They are the real owner of our organization. They are the people who have the upper hand. They are the people who pay the salary for every so-called director or every so-called manager or CEO in the organization. Tell him and her who is paying your salary, sir, it's from the donation. The donation for whom, sir? From for the orphan and the needy. So get 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 yourself straight. Set yourself straight when you talk about the people who pay your salary and don't actually feel how 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 much they suffer. And this is a problem which I want you and everyone in your campus. To keep rallying, tell them all the people who employ you are the orphans and the needy and the widows and the elderly and the sick. So don't ever, don't ever and never actually behave badly or in a very corruptive way because your salary comes from those people. Wow. Okay. Okay. So thank you for that. So next question. So this actually been answered by uncle khalid but are there any talent management and future leadership development programs run by any muslim charities that organizations can tap into so um actually um as uncle khalid has just said in the chat isb actually provide um that so do please go check out our website i will link it um once this post goes up but um dr hani are there any other talent management and leadership development uh, i think i think as, as that dr khalid anis yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, he, he, he's my boss. <laughs> Him and, Sarah, Sarah and others. I think regarding to social work, 
most of the uh, uh, charities and jamaat have the Quran train program. Mm -hmm. But in humanitarian work at the moment, uh, uh, what you call it, save the children, have something called the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. Okay. And the Islamic Leaf have another thing called HAD, HAD Humanitarian Academy for Development. Uh, for, for doing. And they are doing this kind of courses. But actually, there are many, many courses are online. Many courses are online as well. And if somebody would like to contact me, I can organize something for you as ISB as well. Inshallah, inshallah. As an individual. Sorry, yeah. So next, but thank you for that. Um, so next question. Um, okay, so what is your opinion regarding CAGE, NGO, and then unique work, if you know about um, CAGE? So I've actually heard about CAGE. What, what's happened. CAGE? CAGE, um, so anybody else who hasn't heard of CAGE, they um, focus on um, justice for people who have been wrongly imprisoned, I believe. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. All, oh. all, all, see, see, alhamdulillah, 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 we moved from the mosque era in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to the humanitarian era with Islamic Leaf and the others to the advocacy and the human rights era, which is Cage and Mend and the others. Yeah, yeah. All of them reflect the maturity of our community, mm. whether it's Cage or Mend or what do you call it, uh, uh, Muslim, what do you call it, human rights group or some others and others and others and others. This is coming because our community, my father, when he came here as an Asian uh, liberal in the 50s and 60s of the Second World War, he could not be able to read and write English. He and my mother managed to build uh, uh, the halal shop, the mosque, the madrasa. But this moved on others, others to develop. And I am with any new organization who are dealing with the need for the community. Like when I talked about one of those organizations, which is for the deaf, this is another organization run by Muslims in UK and others. Many organizations are coming like this. So I am with any, any new good initiative, transparent, 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 and fair to everyone to start their work. Human rights, advocacy, or whatever you call it. Political even, social, whatever you call it. And thank you so much, Dr. Khani. And anybody else who's interested in CAGE, because I've heard about their work and they are fantastic. I just This book is literally just next to me right now um, by Moaz Zimbeg, en en Enemy Combat. Um, he works with CAGE. Just a little sign if you want to read that. Um, I just saw it next to me and I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, so the next question is, what PhD um, did you do at Birmingham University? It was not a PhD, it was an MD, Doctor of Medicine. Doctor oh, of Medicine is a degree which was given to uh, doctors uh, by the medical school in, uh, in the university and they exempted me mm -hmm. because they considered me like a local student. I see. And it was on spina bifida. You know spina bifida? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a, a, a big problem in the 70s and 80s and 60s and there are too many theories about it. And let me uh, uh, give you a good experience of what I have. When I failed, as I told you, alhamdulillah, I failed in my thesis in 1990. And 1991, Bangladesh fraud came. And the Islamic Leaf at the time was very small. And two young men from Bradford raised 30,000 pounds. 30,000 pounds. And the British Airways wanted to give us two first-class tickets to go to Bangladesh. I was going to, and, and after to submit my thesis, actually, before November 1991. I was going around and around and around and around because it was June, July, and it was three, four months to submit the thesis. Nobody come forward and said, I'll go to Bangladesh. You know what I have done, Sister uh, Iman? I put my thesis like this. Wow. So, okay, I'm going. This was one of the blessed Friday, the Good Fridays. Mm -hmm. And they contacted my colleague, he's a volunteer, I think he's still alive in Bradford, uh, 
ميبي سيستر فاطمة جافيد بستان ويل تيل يو هو زي اند هاف تو انترفيو هيم ون داي كوز ستيل الايف الحمد لله اون ذات داي when I decided to go to Bangladesh and drop my thesis. You know what happened? Tell me what. Tell me what. You tell, you me. tell me what. In the evening, I went to my, after Juma prayer, I went to my office in the Department of uh, Physics. I was looking at the same data. Same data. Mm -hmm. Which I wrote maybe five, six years before. I, 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 I failed. The same data, Allah inspired me to reshuffle the data and produce a new hypothesis or theory for the development of such spina bifida and neural tube defects. Wow. I wrote it on a piece of paper at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the evening with a red pen and I went to the supervisor on Monday morning while I was wearing my suit to go to Bangladesh. You know what he told me? Excellent. 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 Put it in the thesis as a new hypothesis. This new hypothesis only came, and this is a message for all your people in the campus. When you prioritize, prior, prioritize the priority of the people to your own priority, Allah will tell you what you think that you'll be more generous to my people than my sister. Take this one. And the data was there for the last four, five years before that. Let, 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 me, let me tell you something as well to, to, to let, let your, your people to be very confident in the religion. My gratitude. You know what gratitude and this is what does mean? To my dog. I love my dog. I love to my mother, to my wife, to my daughter, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know what I wrote? What I wrote on the first page, to whom? To Allah. Wow. To whom? Oh. Say it, say it. Oh. to Allah. And I, got, and I got all the verses in the Quran about the creation of man and the development of the creation of man in the womb of the woman from the dirty water till he or she came out of the womb of the mother. Three pages. You know what the big boss of pathology department in the medical school of Birmingham University told me? He sat me down, told me, honey. I said, yes, sir. Because he was the, he was, he was the dean of the Royal College of Pathology. Wow. You know what he said? He said, honey, I want your thesis to be in our library. That means I want you to pass. Regardless, that, so I did a lot of stupid mistakes in English language, is and are, and the references, and I was stupid. <laughs> and he told me what? I will give you a professor to collect your English language. When I sat down with the professor, Emeritus professor, to correct my language, you know what he told me? Honey, I said, yes, sir. He said, what is this Quran? All, what all this Quran is about? Three pages of Quran is a gratitude in the beginning, and there's no reference. The only thing by Allah. You know what I bought? There's no publisher. There's no uh, library. There's no year. Publisher. Only Allah. I told him one thing, Sister Iman. This is actually for your young people. Isn't it to be a scientific knowledge? I said, yes. He said, you want me to take it out or leave it? No, no, I said, no, 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 keep it. Because now we took the Quran from being a holy book into a book of science and technology. And they did not fail me. Mm. And I got my degree. Not only that, the one who was describing the disease, which I was uh, talking about, spina bifida and neural tube defect, his name in the Latin dictionary was Bucasas. Bucasas. It was Bucasas, Bucasas, Bucasas. And for years I was reading Bucasas. Then I read a review about Bucasas. You know who was he? His name was Abu Qasim al Zahrawi. Wow. An wow. Arab scientist in Andalusia, in a place called Zahra, next to Cordoba. And wow. he wrote. 
30 volumes of medicine, Encyclopedia Medica. I changed his name again in the introduction of the thesis. So you have the gratitude, then you have the correction of the name, and you have Allah with you. But before that, you have the, 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 the data which you have done of a heavy and difficult work which make the young man, before you talk about your religion, talk about what is the result of your work for the community. Then, while you're doing that, you can talk about your, your religion. But talking about religion alone is not good enough. Mashallah, that's, that's amazing. Um, so I'm just looking through. Okay, so we've got a few more questions, if that's okay with you, Dr. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, no problem. Oh, just one of the questions is, um, how can you be contacted later? Uh, on I, yeah, you see, my, my, my telephone number is a public, public number. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, inshallah. Or you could become, or, or you could become my secretary. <laughs> inshallah, that would be, I'd love that. So, anyway, next thing. Um, how important is mentoring for our young Muslim adults? It is not important. It is crucial. Don't let those old people live this life before mentoring you. I mentioned some of them, and there's plenty of them in every Islamic groups or non-Islamic groups. They must mentor you. Don't get the young man or woman when they come to your organization to sit down with any officer. No. As I mentioned, the professor in the medical school when he send the medical student to the hospital, he tells the consultant and he tells or she tells the senior staff, look after this young medical student as a future doctor. It is a crucial. It's not only about how much they read. It's how much they learn the technique of reading through the experience of the senior. In the good old days, we used to call this that actually have been brought up on the hand of a sheikh. What's been written in the book, something. Then you look at the behavior of the sheikh, something else. And the experience of the sheikh, something else. And the number of the sheikh that they can mentor you and teach you. Mentoring is something crucial. And if, that's why I'm telling you, if, if, you, want to, if you want to become my boss, you can organize the program and I'll be, I'll be uh, under your command, inshallah. And because mentoring is a vital, vital, vital aspect of any, of any training. We do cut and paste training programs for capacity building, mm -hmm. which does not include mentoring. Mentoring is experience, is values, talk about values, moralities, a vision, and all these sorts of things. You cannot get it by a consultant who just you pay him or her $1,000 a day, $1,000 pound a day, and give you some good presentation. It's good, but not good enough. Mm. Wow. So tell your leaders, mentor the young. Mm. The young from the age of five, six, when you make the animal voices and you wear the Mickey Mouse costumes, and run away with them. Tell them you are, you, are, you are a leader. You let this young kid to believe in what you say. You have to raise your standard and enable yourself to communicate with the six and seven years old boy and girl if you are a leader. Mm. Yeah. If you only talk about a certain, uh, to a certain age, I tell you, the door is open. Out. 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 Call yourself a leader. What have you done for the kids? That for the teens, then for the young men and women, then for the elderly. Mm -hmm. And this is the quality of mentorship. Wow, this is really profound. So I think we only have. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, we've got one more question left. So, um, how have the needs of people changed since the beginning of your journey? Are there more donations, or do more people need help? It's both. Mm -hmm. When we started, uh, it was the first year when we when we received after seven months of working, like it was July, August, nineteen ninety four. 
when we were sitting in the community center in Birmingham and we opened one of the envelopes and for 1,000 pounds, we made the big takbir, the right takbir. 1,000 pounds, Allah Akbar. Because we always used to receive during this time, 1984, 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, whatever it is. And you know, my, my colleague and I, what, what he said when we were sitting in the community center there, this 1,000 pounds, inshallah, will have the impact of 1 billion pounds. Wow. Alhamdulillah, Islamic Tiff now spent more than 1 million pounds over the last 35 years. This is how, actually, to see that actually we were very happy to collect the half a penny. At the time, there's no half a penny now. A penny, two penny. You know, have you seen the coins, the, 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 the brownish one? Yeah. It's, it's not there anymore. It's not there anymore. The nickels and the others, okay. And, but now, because there's a lot of conflicts or man-made conflicts, or planned conflicts, and whatever called extremism and radicalism and whatever, whatever there's not the time to, to talk about who is behind these conflicts. You need to do more work. That's why in one of my, uh, uh, in one of the, 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 the discussions, I said voluntarism, voluntarism now is not a voluntarism anymore. It becomes a compelling duty. Because in one area only, in the Middle East, which is Syria, Yemen, Iraq at the time, and Libya and others, about 30 to 40 million people in dire need of help. And you tell me, I'll come, I do one hour a week? Mm -hmm. You tell me when you work and join the humanitarian organization, oh, I say I go after 4 o'clock because I want to go to the cinema with my wife? It's not anymore. Now, humanitarian work is not a sunnah or wajib. It is a duty. It's farz or farb. The more you see, found conflict and uh, uh, problems, the more you need to work and work and work. Whether you are an elderly trying to promote the issue on your social media or whether you are working for some other organization and you volunteer every day, one or two or three hours on the social media, or whether you are working. Nowadays, the income of the Muslim charities in the UK could be more than 500 million. It's wow. growing. Because people like you, when, you, see, I, you know what, how much my, my first salary, which I took when I was a medical doctor, the first salary in 1978, end of 78, beginning of 79, how much a month? I couldn't. I get it. I'm not sure. Less than 300 pounds. Wow. And it's too much for me. <laughs> Love bar. 300 pounds, 200 pounds, 250. Now, those doctors, the young doctors, got about 2,000 pounds or more. And we used to work from Monday morning till Monday morning <laughs> if we have on call duty Saturday yeah. and Sunday. Non stop. Wow. So the more problem you face, actually Allah provide you with more money you have at the, at the same time. Wow. So Alhamdulillah, on that note, I think um, we've just about run out of time. So thank you so much, Dr. Hani, on behalf of myself and of campus. And thank you for everybody who joined in today and listened to this 